It's the final round of the World Juniors Championship and we are looking at the girls section under 20. In the lead is Beloslava Krasteva from Bulgaria with a fantastic tournament so far, scoring 8.5 out of 10 undefeated throughout this tournament. And she's playing in the final round against Candela Francisco from Argentina. She's one point behind Krasteva and needs to play for a win with the black pieces. So let's have a look how this uh, direct encounter is going to uh, to work out. Kasteva plays 1d4 and in a must win situation, um, Candela goes for one of the sharpest options with the move c5 on move two. Either in fighting by to, uh, to go for Benoni after d5 it's uh, e6 for instance, or even the Benko Gambit. And these lines, they can potentially become very sharp a lot of uh, players, they don't like to uh, to enter these uh, complicated uh, positions. And therefore, Krasteva goes for the move knight f3. And now after pawn takes pawn, knight recaptures b6, knight c3, bishop b7, f3 is played, e6, e4. We do have transposition to some sort of uh, Sicilian with uh, pawns on e4 and c4. We are familiar with the uh, Maroxi bind setup in which white has a nice space advantage but with space there also comes a huge responsibility taking care of the uh, extra squares available and that's actually a very interesting um, choice by uh, by black to go for this line as objectively speaking white may be a bit better but it offers really good counter chances so after d6 bishop e2 a6 bishop e3 knight bd7 castling kingside Bishop e7, rook c1, castling kingside. I'm just making a leap uh, forward after a3, queen c7, b4, rook a c8. We have a very typical hedgehog type of uh, structure. And as I said, white has a nice space advantage, but black is rock solid and will look for ways to uh, strike back somehow, either um, on the queen side or in the center. And they're also attacking ideas on the king side. Let's, ha let's have a look how that uh, continues. By far the most common move now is the move queen to uh, d2. Just centralizing the queen, connecting the rooks, that's absolutely uh, fine for, uh, for white. But Kasteva uh, deviates from the, the well-known uh, paths here with the move queen to b3. Rook f e8, solid uh, move. May, you may wonder what it's uh, exactly doing, but in certain cases, your bishop would like to uh, to come back, or uh, even the rook on e8. It's well, it's maybe a little bit uh, far ahead in uh, in time, but the rook is also opposing the bishops on the um, e file. So if black is able to strike in the center, there are potential tactics against these pieces as well. White goes rook f d1, and now also another typical maneuver for these positions. It's the move queen b8. So you're making space for your rook on the c-file, but one of the key ideas here is to maneuver this bishop from e7 to d8 and then to c7 and form a battery so that the pawn on uh, h2 can be attacked by both the queen and bishop. Very typical plan. White play the move uh, king h1 so that if it's needed, the bishop can always come back to g1 to cover that, uh, that square. So this is very... Typical uh, play from uh, from both sides, even though it should be said that the queen is normally speaking, it's on uh, on d2, where it's more uh, centrally placed. And now, Francisco goes for this move, h5. And you may wonder, what, what's this idea? Well, this is also very typical. And uh, the h-pawn is coming forward. White played bishop f1, and now the pawn comes to h4. Very interesting. And the idea is very simple, to play h3 to get rid of the pawn on g2, then you would like to get rid of the pawn on f3, and then on the pawn on um, on e4. And I think that's that's just a, a very nice plan, all with the aim to activate that light squared bishop. You can't really stop the h pawn from coming forward. If you play h3, then knight h5 will be played, and you can feel this uh, g3 square is really weak. In general, the dark squares, they become uh, very vulnerable. So white. Kasteva played here uh, this move queen a2. Remarkable decision, but the queen wants to keep the pawn defended, while at the same time the queen also realizes that it's more needed somewhere on the second rank to guard the uh, king side. 
95 plate, keeping uh, more pressure against that pawn. And it's a little provocation. If white ever goes f4 to attack the knight, then the knight comes in to g4, attacking the bishop on e3. And also the pawn on e4 becomes more loose. So don't get tempted by this possibility to, to kick the knight away from the center. Knight a4 was played so that white now is attacking the pawn on b6. And here black goes for the move bishop d8, protecting the pawn. And so far... Okay, there is no direct contact between the white and black pieces. And white could have decided here to, to play a move like queen e2, to centralize the queen and the maneuvering uh, goes on. But instead, they follow the move bishop g5, attacking the pawn on, um, on h4. And now, no choice, h3. That's the move um, Candela was, uh, was looking for. And I think it's um, it's a nice idea. I mean, you, you can play moves like, like g3 or g takes h3, but it also offers possibilities even to sacrifice either on f3 or maybe on uh, e4. The queen can also always come to a8, so that will reinforce the power on this uh, diagonal. Bishop takes f6 was played. And now bishop takes f6. Very interesting decision by black. Giving up the pawn on b6, which can now be taken by the knight. Attacking the rook at the same time, so the rook goes away. And now, obviously, the knight is vulnerable on b6. It's unprotected, so it goes back right away to, uh, to a4. And here again, a lot of possibilities. You're a pawn down. You had a possibility to take on g2 already for a couple of moves. It was played now. Should point out that a move like d5 is, is a, to be screamed here. This is the move you would like to play as black to activate all your pieces, the rooks in the center, the bishops. Probably the reason why black didn't go for this option is that after e takes, e takes, looks as if white is able to um, keep the position closed by advancing the pawn on the queen side. But things are not that simple. If you find here the move knight c6, black has a fantastic blockade and the knight on d4 will be kicked away. It's attacked by both the knight and the bishop. Very soon the d-pawn will come forward, opening the diagonal for the bishop on b7. The queen can come in. There are great attacking prospects for black in this case. But as I said, just by looking at this move d5, you feel like things are not going uh, into black's favor. But that's uh, that's very difficult to see uh, from afar. H takes g2 seems to be like the logical move. But here, there are three possible recaptures. But... Why not just recapture with the queen? Like consolidating your position looks very natural. Was not played. Bishop takes g2 on the board. But now I, I would say that a move like bishop g5 is, is very attractive with the idea to uh, get a grip on, uh, on these dark squares. You're attacking the rook as well. Candela went for the move knight g6 also with the idea to get a grip on, uh, on these dark squares. Queen f2. Bishop e5, so that you're controlling the f4 square. h3 was played, not sure it was really needed, but you should understand that the queen and bishop were already indirectly eyeing that pawn on, uh, on h2. And I think here again, something like bishop f4, it's a very interesting move, attacking the rook. If you go away, then d5, and I mean, this, this goes very deep, but the plan is not only to open the center, but you would like to... Get your queen involved again. Queen e5 with idea to come over to the king side. I think that's the, the way to go for, for black. Instead, they followed queen c7 with idea to get a queen over via this uh, way. But now, knight e2 is an uh, excellent move as uh, white is about to, to play f4. And of course, it's also keeping an eye on this uh, b6 square. Maybe the queen can come there at uh, some point. Knight f4 was played. Knight takes, bishop takes. Attacking the rook, rook goes away, and now you're still a pawn down, but black is looking for counterplay with the move rook f8. Intending to play f5, but now the knight on a4 has done its job, comes back into the game via b2. After f5, the knight comes to d3 to get this bishop away from, uh, from that annoying f4 square. f takes e4, rook protects the bishop, so capturing the bishop doesn't make sense. You can take back on e4 though. And now e5 was played. And it looks as if that if you take the, the bishop and black recaptures with a the rook, there is a bit of pressure. This bishop 
on b7 seems to be better than the bishop on g2, but don't forget, white is still a pawn up and more and more pieces are coming off the board. White can play queen e3 and at the right moment try to strike with c5. I think white is still better here. But instead there followed queen e2, but now the bishop stays on the board, goes back to h6. Still white has plenty of ideas, including advancing on the queen side, trying to utilize it extra pawn uh, over there. But rook g1 was played. I think this is a step in uh, in the wrong direction. I don't think the rook was really needed there. Now, look, bishop c8. The bishop is coming over to, um, to pressurize that pawn on h3. c5 played, looking for counterplay. And black is not going to react. Black goes for rook f6. You're protecting the pawn, but you're looking for ways to launch an attack against the white king along the sixth rank. Now... C takes d6 was played. I think that's another strange decision. It's very important to keep your main assets on the board. I think with pawn on c6, it will be much harder for the black queen to uh, join play uh, any time. Because if the queen moves, the c pawn advances and is ready to promote. C takes d6 played. Now queen takes d6. You're attacking that knight on d3 together with the queen and rook. Knight comes to c5. That was the idea. But now the bishop comes back to f4, beautifully placed on uh, f4, controlling a lot of dark squares. Rook c3 played, now the rook comes to h6. You're putting more pressure against the pawn on h3. Okay, it's still defended by both the bishop on g2 and the rook on, um, on c3. And now rook d3 played, and this is a very interesting moment. I mean, you're a pawn down as black, and you have the option just to go away with the queen, and after the exchange of rooks in a position like this, I think black still has tremendous attacking chances as all these pieces are ready to attack the white king. The queen can come to h4, even sometimes rook g6, rook g3. Uh, pawn on, um, on h3 is in big trouble and it's very difficult to challenge black's pieces. But on move 39, approaching the time control, white is in severe time pressure, only about one minute to, uh, to make it to the... Uh, to the extra time control. Black decided here, fantastic idea. The move queen takes d3, sacrificing the queen. And maybe this was totally overlooked by white. This is a total shocking move. But what, what is the idea? Well, with such a little time on the clock, there's no choice to work out all the consequences in the game. Krasteva just took with a knight on, uh, on d3, accepting the, the queen. And we will see soon what happened. But... Maybe a safer idea would have been just to take with the queen to exchange more attackers after a knight takes d3. There is bishop takes h3. It looks incredibly dangerous. If you take on h3, it's a rook takes h3 with check and both your knight and king are in trouble. So white uh, is losing a piece in that case. But you can play knight takes f4. If you take back, then the, the rook is going away. So you can always escape with your king and this rook end game should be holdable for... Um, for white and also if you don't take back on f4 but you just go away with the bishop with a discovered check you can play knight h3 and uh, you block something like this and uh, eventually we get a rook end game in which black is a pawn up but such an end game if you put the king on f2 and get ready to uh, play rook g5 the king is very close supporting the pawn on uh, uh, on e4 whenever it's needed this is 99% sure this is going to lead to a draw. And that's exactly what Belaoslava was uh, looking for. If she draws the game, it is uh, the uh, tournament victory and the women's um, world uh, title uh, under 20. So very important moment on move 40. Just with seconds uh, ticking down on the clock. Knight takes d3 was played. Very principled move. But now it's bishop takes h3. And this is very dangerous. There's a big choice to be made. But bishop g4 is the huge threat. Giving a check, winning the queen on e2. If you take on f4, bishop g4, as I said. And here is just an extra exchange for, for black. So in the game, they followed bishop takes h3. Now it's rook takes h3 with check. King goes to g2. And now it's rook d takes d3. And now the situation is that black has a rook and a bishop for the queen. But the attack is still going on. And the main threat here is to go rook h2. With a check, you're winning the, um, 
the queen on e2. So the queen got to go away. First it went to a2 with, uh, with check. And the king has several squares to go to, but you go into the corner, it's the safest square. And uh, it's, it's a big problem because rook h2, winning the queen is still the threat. If the queen goes away, then you still give a check on h2. And if king f1, then it's a letter made with the two rooks. King can't go anywhere. So the queen instead went back to b1. But that doesn't solve the problems. There is a rook h2 check forcing the king to go to the back rank. And now the big question is how to get this rook from d3 in fourth well. Candela Francisco played here the move rook c3. And that's a very effective um, idea just with a plan of getting the rook to c1, winning the queen. And in the end, black will emerge with an extra bishop. If you try to control the second rank with your rook, so that you're attacking the rook on h2, it's rook h1 check. So your queen is in trouble. If rook blocks, then you can take first the rook and then play the move rook to c1. And um, you're winning the queen. So that's an instructive line. Instead, Beloslav didn't know what to do. She played the move a4. There is rook to c1. With check, white is forced to give up the queen. Queen takes, bishop takes, and you are just a piece down. The past pawns on the queen side, or potential past pawn, it's, it's not dangerous at all. The majority is not going to work. Rook to g6, attacking the pawn on a6. Rook b2, rook gets behind so that you're about to eliminate that b pawn. Rook b6, bishop d2, you're attacking the pawn on b4. b5. A takes B, A takes B, Bishop E3, you're attacking the Rook on uh, B6, Rook goes away, King H7, King E1, look, the King is still cut, and now G5 was played, and there's not much you can do against the promotion of the G pawn, while the White's passed pawn is not dangerous at all. This is the moment, Francisco managed to win with the black pieces, and tie for first with Beloslava, Kasteva, both are on 8.5 out of 11. But just because of favorable tiebreak, um, she managed to win this uh, direct uh, encounter. She managed to become uh, the new world girls champion under 20. Fantastic performance. So the world title goes to Argentina. Fantastic performance. I should point out that also Carissa Yip managed to get 8.5 by winning her last round game. And uh, well, but the title is for uh, Candela Francisco. So 17 years old, beautiful performance by, uh, by her. Congratulations to Argentina. So the future of Argentinian chess is looking absolutely great.